just to prove it, a token, a token minority, I believe we have as a guest on right now, uh, his new book is, I want to make sure that I get this right, um, well, you know what, he can tell us about his new book, it is the uh, United States of Socialism, Mr. D'Souza, how are you, sir? Hey, good to be on the show, it's been a while. Thank you very much. I want to be clear, since you have more melanin in your skin, uh, do you believe that anything I just said regarding nationalism in this pandemic uh, was racial supremacy? <laughs> No, not at all. Um, the uh, yeah, I think it's interesting how the uh, there's been an effort to spin this in racial terms, and I think that it actually reflects this uh, this kind of new socialism we could call it. And what I mean by that is simply that socialism traditionally was all about class, the rich and the poor, the workers and the capitalists. Right. But now we have this, I call it identity socialism. And uh, what I mean by that is socialism is now married to the politics of race and gender and sexual orientation and immigration. And so socialism today is un would have been unrecognizable to Marx right. uh, because it's socialism married to this new identity politics. Yeah, and that must be frustrating for you, uh, Mr. D'Souza, because one thing, you know, we hear about the white-black thing a whole lot in the United States, and uh, I don't think I'm letting the cat out of the bag when I say that you're, uh, you were, you're, you're originally from India, your family, your lineage, and uh, I've met some Indians who are far darker than black people. They don't seem to be included in that mix. Wow. Is that generally South Indians? Generally, but not entirely. The um, India runs the whole spectrum. If you look at the uh, Indian Bollywood actresses, they look uh, basically white. Right. And that, uh, uh, but on the other hand, you've got Indians who are completely dark. Now, I think here it's important to make a distinction between race and skin color because right. um, uh, the Indians can be dark skinned without being Negroid in a racial sense. Right, but um, racists yeah. would treat them the same way is what I'm saying. If everyone right, in this country sure. was a racist, they would look, I mean, if you compare Drake for example, mm -hmm. to uh, right. uh, uh, there was a guy, Prakash, who is a, uh, a, s a server at my favorite local, he's very, yeah. very dark. And I'm like, wait, you're, you're, wait, someone call Ice T. Uh, if there's a real <laughs> racist, he would treat him just as poorly, but we don't hear the same, it doesn't seem like Indian Americans have the same kind of political clout and voice. And that seems important, especially when we're talking about identity politics with socialism right now. Well, the other thing is, if you go to India, India has now become, I would say, one of the most pro-American countries in the world. I know. So that there's very wide uh, pro-Western and pro-American sentiment. Uh, even the old nonsense that I used to hear when I was growing up, you know, the anti-British, colonialism is horrible, India would have been a fabulously rich country were it not for colonialism. All of this kind of bloviation has subsided. Uh, you have a small clack of socialists who still say this kind of stuff, but by and large, they're they're ridiculed by the rest can of I India. Can I ask you, Dinesh? Uh, by the way, um, Audio Wade there just loves Democrats. I don't know why. Maybe you can shoot him straight. Uh, uh, but <laughs> why is it that they're so... I've noticed this with other countries, having been raised in Canada. There was a huge rash of anti-Americanism in Canada, and that's pretty obvious because they're jealous. This is a land of really cool stuff. Canada is silly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then I've noticed, though, the two groups of people who are most pro-American, this is anecdotal, you would probably have the data on it, have been Indians and, for some reason, Australians a lot of oh, the time. Hmm. Okay. Why do you think that is with Indians? Why are they so pro-American Western civilization? Because it seems like a lot of, I mean, you look at the yogi culture here, the vegan ultra-left culture, they're often espousing what they view as, as Indian sort of values. Right. The, you know, the, 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 in, the leftist in America who's pursuing India uh, and thinks India is cool because of, you know, <laughs> Hare Krishna and because of all this stuff, they're chasing an India that the Indians are now running away from. Right. Uh, they're pursuing mm. an Indian dream that Indians don't have anymore. Indians, by and large, want the American dream. Now, when I was growing up, uh, I grew up under socialism. It wasn't totalitarian socialism. It was democratic socialism. Right. Uh, and the three things I remember the most about it are, number one, uh, first of all, we had a seven-year wait to get a phone. Uh, we never had a wow. phone. Obama phone wow. lady would have been pissed. <laughs> yeah, Very so pissed. mad. She would have been pissed. Hey, what do you think about India? India sucks. <laughs> Obama got me a phone. <laughs> I don't know, Dinesh, nothing. Sorry, go ahead. So then, number two, the ration card. Oh. And see, now when we go into a grocery store and they tell you you can only buy, you know, one roll of toilet paper, that's a little temporary whiff of what it was like growing up in a socialist country where it's every a real month, whiff. Yeah, they'll tell you, you know. You can only buy so much cooking oil. You can only buy so much rice. And the third is just 
corruption at every level of government. I mean, you have to pay people under the table all the time. Yeah. Right. There's corruption here, but not in the same way. So I think Indians who, a whole generation of Indians uh, my my age, fled India. My brother went to sea, other people went to Dubai, a third group of people went to Canada and Australia, a fourth group came to the United States. Wait, did you so say that your children, brother went to sea? Like he, like yeah, he, my brother went to, my brother went as a cadet on a merchant marine oh, wow. ship and he basically oh. started out of Singapore and he made his life, he became a captain. Is he a Scientologist so now? He fled no. India that way. <laughs> okay. He's not a Scientologist though, right? Not that. Uh, uh, no, no. Okay, not. good. Sea org. I just wanted C. to be clear. This, this yeah, call would the, be, the goodbye, just the, uh, the, <laughs> sorry, Native American, not Indian, Native American. <laughs> Phone, uh, you know, the whole uh, yeah, broadcast yeah. would be stopped. Um, well, I think that's, I do want to say, because we don't have a lot of time, and I appreciate making the time, Dinesh, but I think it's very important, and you do a very good job of this, delineating uh, between totalitarian socialism and what they call or brand democratic socialism, because it still is socialism. And I've experienced this in Quebec, obviously. I'm, I would assume to a lesser degree than India, but it still is a 52% income tax rate. Mm -hmm. You still are talking wow. about a socialized healthcare system where, yeah, listen, now they opened it up to privatization in 2005, but when my mom needed an MRI and they had fewer MRI machines in the whole country than they had, I think, in the state of Vermont back then, then wow. if you pay a few hundred dollars under the table, you can get an MRI within a couple months as opposed to 14. So um, I think it's important for people who've experienced that to be out there uh, speaking to, to their experiences. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, at the level of pure principle, democratic socialism differs from totalitarian socialism, <clears throat> kind of like gang rape differs from individual rape. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> look at well, it this I'm... way. <laughs> look at it this way. I'll explain that. You know. Uh, Let's say. Yes. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> uh, hold, hold, hold on. Hold on. Let me process this. And also, by the way, it reminds me, audio Wade, we need to tell yeah. that story about the uh, the elephant seal elephant rape seals, because yeah. that we were talking about that before. We'll come back, right. we'll come yeah. back to it. Continue with your rape analogy, Mister. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh right. So what I'm saying is that in both case, in both cases, the coercion. Uh, whether the coercion comes from one guy or from a majority. Imagine you have a group of people, they all have one marble, right? And mm -hmm. one guy has 10 marbles. So authoritarian socialism means that one guy gets to grab the guy who has 10 marbles and take his marbles. Here's democratic socialism. A majority of the people with one marble all decide to use the same level of force, um, but use the fact that a majority of them have decided to confiscate the other guys. In both cases, the other guy is deprived of his property. Right. right. In one case, it's done by one guy. In the other case, it's done by force, right. by a group, claiming the legitimacy of the majority. And that's my point. Is yeah. That in yeah. a sense, from the point of view of principle, there's no fundamental difference. There's a confiscation in both cases. There's force employed in both cases. And an injustice is done in both right. cases. Exactly. And that's why it's very important to understand the idea of private property and constitutional rights. Like you said, yeah. I think it's a brilliant analogy. In one case, somebody takes the marble. In the other case, the nine marbles take the remaining marble. And if Joe Biden were at the helm, he'd just lose them. There oh, would be no, no where? No huh? yeah, he marbles? doesn't have them. Huh? No marbles. Why am I? Bangarang? All right. Uh, <laughs> it is Dinesh. The book, I believe, is um, available for pre-order. June uh, 2nd. It's going to be out on June 2nd, United States of Socialism, correct? Yes, you can pre-order it now, but it won't be in stores until later. So I'm just thinking through and, you know, there's a, what's strange about it now is to me, when you go into stores and they're empty, my wife's from Venezuela. So she's been telling me about the empty stores in, uh, in, in Venezuela now for years. Yeah. Uh, but I never knew what that felt like. But now a little bit with this strange virus situation, we're getting a preview of what normal life is like in socialist countries. Yes. Yeah. That being said, in your private life, take advantage during this pandemic because if she's from Venezuela, that's one less hungry mouth to feed. Dinesh D'Souza, we must go. <laughs> the book is United States of Socialism, available for pre-order uh, June 2nd.